Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, almost in the East Coast. Um, we've got our uh, eclectic blend of uh, of hosts today. Hello, Pete. Hello, Mac. Mac is coming in from an undisclosed location. We will keep his mic silent so as not to uh, give that away. We can't tell he's been working because his goatee is going every direction. So um, uh, that's usually a good sign. Thanks, Mac, for representing us all out in the field today. Um, Today's topic, today's guest, Electrosonics, Carl Winkler. How electrosonics is synonymous with durability, with reliability. Um, if you've if you've watched the news, I can't imagine that 99.82% of those um, are going to be through Electrosonics mic listening or listening through Electrosonics IFB. Um, it's a, a really great tradition. Um, I've been using that product um, nearly all my career. Um, you, you, you come across it in ways that you never think about um, when you're first coming up. It's like, what's an IFB? And you're learning, you know, after you get out of college, you're learning all these things. And, and you know, so many times we just shorthand it, into, you know, what block is your electro in, right? right. Yeah. And, um, if blocks are synonymous with electro, right? If somebody says, what's block 21, what's block 26, you know, you're talking about electro, right? And it's just, it. it's funny how things evolve in our industry. And, um, you know, all through the years, besides the fact that, that Electrosonics builds a really great product, highly durable, um, technically, you know, it's a, um, uh, uh, best in class. Um, with, with all that though, Carl, you've always been at the forefront of educating, not just building great products and selling good, you know, selling those great products, but also educating the user along the way. And, um, that's one of the things I respect most about companies that build really great products when they also put great training with it. And they understand that RF um, there's a little voodoo there. We understand that. We know that everybody sees it a little black magic, but um, as you're going to show today, everything's quantifiable. Um, it's this is just science. Um, right, it is yes. invisible. You know, I think that is the one thing RF and COVID have in common. <laughs> we we can't see these, and and some some of it can be very frustrating because we can't necessarily touch it. Right. Which in the case of COVID is a good thing. But um, we, we, we have to work that through in our minds and we have to apply that logic and the science to it to, to better understand it. Um, uh, I will stop talking and I'm gonna talk, let Pete just go through a little of the Q&A. We see people are still uh, climbing into the room. So um, Pete, why don't you talk about Q&A and uh, then we'll uh, hand it over to Carl and Mac. Have a good day. I know you're gonna be watching this. so. Uh, We'll catch up at the end. Well, I'm glad to have Carl here. This is really exciting because I too have uh, worked with Electrosonics forever uh, and still do often. Uh, most often we see it when we're do using them for IFB uh, yeah. on any on many of the productions we do. And uh, uh, as a frequency coordinator, uh, I always have to deal with uh, ENG crews that come in with their equipment and uh, some of them say, well, I don't know what my frequency is. I said, well, let me show you how to use your equipment to find out. Right. <laughs> exactly. So uh, if you want to ask a question, there's a little question tab on the uh, your webinar control panel. Just type it in. You won't see everybody's question, but we're passing them all on to call to Carl. And the the list of questions will be posted with the video uh with indication of when it was answered within the video so you can go back and reference it so carl go ahead it's all yours great well thanks so much for having me um pete and kelly mac and uh you know i've been at electrosonics almost 16 years now and you mentioned you know that we've always um, worked hard at education and i have done that personally but it certainly started web way before me with larry fisher and of course, Gordon Moore um, is, uh, you know, did a lot of seminars at um, Infocom, for instance, and has done things at some of our dealers and things like that. So 
you know, we, we all take it very seriously. Um, our wireless guide publication, which is um, find, findable on our website. We're is, not uh, seeing the PowerPoint screen. Uh, no, I'm just going to talk for a second and I'll share that okay. in a sec. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our wireless guide has, has become a, an industry standard for baseline education on wireless. And even though it's maybe 20 years out of date and doesn't talk about digital wireless, the fundamentals are still the same. So that's a good publication. And what I'll do is I'll send a link over to you guys and, and uh, you can put that in there as well. So what I'm going to do now is uh, go ahead and pick up uh, the PowerPoint. And uh, let's see here. We'll go through a few slides. And, and a couple times here and there, I'll ask if there's any questions uh, when we get to the end of a section. Now, a lot of you do know Electrosonics, but I've uh, run across uh, plenty of folks, particularly in the live event industry, that don't know us very well. So I thought I'd kind of give just a quick background on, on who we are. Uh, you know, every year at the Oscars, there's the category of best sound mixing. And I'm sure you recognize these fantastic films. And every one of these films was made using Electrosonics. Uh, the most recent 1917 uh, sound mixer, Stuart Wilson, I read about his use of the uh, little tiny SSM transmitters because they're the only smaller, uh, small enough units to be used inside those World War I type helmets. So um, we have a long history in filmmaking going back decades. And uh, of course, we're very well known in broadcast, both for news, as Pete mentioned, you know, the ENG crews come in and they're almost always using electrosonics. Uh, but we're also very well uh, used in episodic production and reality television all over the world. Uh, some of the, the titles that you've certainly heard and seen, no doubt. In fact, we just finished watching the latest uh, Better Call Saul season, uh, which is all filmed here in Albuquerque, as was Breaking Bad before that. So it's kind of nice to have that going on locally here. And once in a while, we get to visit the sets and see what's happening. And uh, what many people may not be aware, but in the past few years, because of the SSM, the little tiny transmitter, uh, we're also uh, on Broadway today with, with many of these uh, top shows that are happening. And so that's uh, something relatively new for us. Now, Pete, you and I were talking about this a little bit ago, but frequency band planning. Uh, this is a very important topic for anyone using wireless systems. And, um, you know, when you're doing a show, uh, who is it that decides how the frequency band get split up is that you or is that someone else on on the show well if i'm the frequency coordinator it's my it's what i decide and mm -hmm. it's not because anybody else really wants it most people on the show won't even understand what it is or where it's for yeah but for me it's important to keep different type of rf systems just as you just said they're separated and i put all of the certainly all the transmitters in one section separated by a couple of TV channels away from the wireless mics. It just they just play better that way. Yeah, and that's true for comms and IEMs and and wireless mics and and anything that's that's there. You want to keep these systems away from each other if possible. And that's gotten a little more challenging recently in some ways because a lot of wireless mic systems now are wideband tuning. So and so are the in-air systems. Um, but one of the things that uh, is is a challenge here, just as you said is that a lot of people are unaware of this. And a lot of people, even in our business, don't always remember all the different types of systems that have to be uh, considered when doing a band plan. Uh, but here, I've just given a bunch of examples. You know, If you're at a sporting event, you might have the ENG crews, like you mentioned. You might have player mics. You might have the national anthem. You might have a halftime show. And uh, there may be uh, speeches and, and you know who knows what, presentations. All those things need to be factored in. And oftentimes, they're forgotten. Sometimes people think, okay, it's wireless mics we're talking about, but they forget about the comm systems. Or maybe they remember the comms, but they forget the IEMs. So this is the first uh, stage is to make a exhaustive list of all the different RF sources that might be uh, on site in your event, and then figure out which parts of the spe spectrum that they need to go into. And uh, so here's an example band plan uh, showing how these systems might be split up and I think this is a slide that's existed for a long time. I think it's in some of James Stoffa's presentations and um, it, it gets modified over the years because there's different types of equipment now available. But for instance, in, uh, in the kind of mid-band VHF, you might have the Com Comtech type IFBs. Uh, then at the upper uh, VHF, you might have the RAD uh, comm system. You might have RIFBs in the VHF band and so on. Walkie talkies typically are exist in the 450 to 470 range, which bumps right up against the bottom of your UHF wireless mic range at 470. 
And so this is just one example. You don't have to do exactly this, but it gives some idea of which types of equipment might go into different slots. And this has become more important in the last 10 years as the RF spectrum has gotten eaten up and auctioned off and the noise floor is higher. We have to be more careful about this than we used to. And yet the demands for wireless continue to rise. So it can become a real challenge. Here's some stuff kind of above the typical UHF range. Uh, the 941 to 960 slot was opened up fairly recently by the FCC. It's wider now and there's more accessibility to it, but you still have to be licensed to use it. And the most common systems that we sell in that band are for the ENG crews. So they find that the spectrum up there is generally wide open, but they are supposed to check in with your SBE guys and make sure that there's no uh, studio transmitter links and things like that. Uh, oftentimes the scan won't reveal enough there, so they need to use that band with care. Up in the 1.4 gig, that's a STL, um, meaning a, a temporary site license has to be obtained to use that because it's shared with aeronautical testing. 1.9 gig, we're seeing a lot of uh, decked type systems there, including intercoms. 2.4, of course, is a, un, a big unlicensed band. And then up at five gigahertz, there's the Neutrik point-to-point -point system, which may be used on large events. So a lot of different types of systems. And uh, this is one example how they could be separated in a band plan. Pete, any other comments on, on band planning? No, that pretty much covers it. I think that it's it's always the way I start, but as the show goes on, as people walk in, I may get stuck with having to put some ENG crews in in maybe in my transmitter area because it because either the bands are full or they're in a band that I can't get anywhere else. So it's right. a good place to start. You're not can't always stay with it though. Yeah, no, totally makes sense. And it's a reminder to generally try to keep some spare frequencies if you can in each band. Of course, they'll get eaten up in a large event, just like you said, and you'll be looking for nooks and crannies everywhere you can find them. But at least by starting with a framework, you have something to work with as opposed to just a free-for-all where everything is just all over the place. And uh, then everyone's wondering why stuff is difficult to make work, you know? So, you know, a lot of our users are um, use bag systems. These are like news crews, run and gun, uh, film production, uh, TV commercial production, videos, things like that. And so in a bag, they might have a mixer recorder, like a sound devices unit, and then a couple channels of wireless up to six or eight or maybe 10 even in some larger bags. But here's an example where, you know, the DCHT, that's our digital camera hop system, that tunes from 470 all the way up to 614 or 608 in the United States. And then our SRC portable two-channel receivers, you might have three of those giving you six channels of wireless. Plus then you might have an LT, which is one of our belt pack transmitters, but in this case acting like an IFB transmitter. And there's a lot of overlap here. So one way to handle this, you know, these are all wideband tuning systems. It's great, gives you a lot of flexibility. But what you might do is segregate these and only use let's say a part of a block or maybe a little more than a block depending for each system so that they never step on each other. And the one thing you wanna be particularly careful of is to leave some room between any transmitter that particularly is really close to any receiver in a bag. I mean, a bag is a small amount of area. And so here you see that I've left a gap between uh, the SRC A1 at the bottom there and the DCHT camera hop and then another gap between the LT acting as an IFB transmitter and the lower part of that uh, SRC B1 range. But nevertheless, this should give pl someone plenty of room to get those six channels of wireless plus an IFB plus a camera hop uh, operational without any overlap between them. And then of course, as I mentioned before, the 941 band can be handy. You could yank one of those SRC A1s and replace it with a SRC 941 and have even less overlap, giving each of the existing uh, bands a little bit more tunable range. So let's get into antenna don'ts because this is one of the areas where I see a lot of craziness. Uh, this is a picture I took on a, on a episodic set and uh, no, won't name any names, but I see this kind of set up quite often in film sets where they have an antenna cluster uh, on a mast, on a single mast, and we've got four different antennas here, two of which are receiver antennas, the one on the far left 
and the, uh, the Sennheiser uh, CP dome there. And then uh, the other two antennas are transmit antennas, an IFB at a quarter watt in the middle there with the LPDA. And then on the end is a modified uh, electrosonics antenna to transmit in the VHF band. So the VHF, that's far enough away, it probably won't be as much of an issue. But my biggest concern was that UHF quarter watt transmitter um, antenna in the middle in between your two receiver antennas. No question that that will increase your noise floor. So my recommendation at this point to this gentleman was to uh, try to move that IFB UHF antenna to another stand and physically separate it from the, the receiver antennas. I don't know that that's always practical, but when it is possible, it's certainly a good practice. The other thing that uh, he was doing was he had his amplified antenna on the far left there cranked up to plus 12 dB of gain on a very short cable. And uh, he was having some issues and I asked him to bring that gain down and uh, the issues went away. So that's another thing. And we'll talk more about that, but RF gain structure is a really big deal and can often be done wrong. I'm sure, uh, Pete, you've seen some crazy antenna setups. Definitely, and, and uh, some of the worst have been with uh, traveling touring shows, musical shows. The monitor console will be set up off stage and they'll just have a forest of antennas right where their console is. And yeah. sometimes all sitting on top of the same equipment rack. And yeah, yeah, I see it all the time. It really depends on the situation because if your performers are less than 10 feet away from you, it probably doesn't make any difference having right. your transmits and receipts because you you know it'll work. But I think antenna placement is the most important thing a coordinator needs to do over everything. You've got yeah. to have your received transmitters at least a wavelength apart, maybe even on each side of the stage, and your transmit antenna at least a two wavelengths away from any of the others, just to uh, keep it all yeah. safe. Absolutely, and and one thing you can do in addition to that is use the polar patterns of the antennas to put them in each other's nulls. Like you know, a, a common practice is to put your receive antennas a little bit forward and then put your transmit antennas behind them and in the direct null of the uh, receive antennas. So things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about antenna polar patterns, but it's something to keep in mind. So yeah, just as you said, here's an example of antennas right next to a whole bunch of other equipment. Uh, in this case, it's in a, an equipment rack. And uh, that's a pretty nasty noise floor that really only lightens up towards the top of that frequency uh, spectra, which is gonna cause problems. Then if you simply move the antennas a few feet away from the rack, now suddenly your whole noise floor goes nearly away and you see, you know, distant DTV channels and other things, but this looks much more palatable and I, I'm gonna be much happier with, with this kind of situation just by moving the antennas a few feet away. So I mentioned polar patterns before and it's always a good idea to look up the spec sheet and, and get a real good sense in, in 3D of what your polar patterns look like because most antennas have a you know, particular pattern that is in a particular plane. Uh, now, circular polarized antennas are um, you know, directional and they have a symmetrical pickup pattern along their axis, but uh, you know, most antennas do not. So for instance, this is a dipole type antenna, or you could call it a half wave. These are very common and, and, and they're in a lot of different form factors, uh, but they have an omnidirectional pattern in the lateral plane but have st fairly strong nulls above and below. So they have like a donut or a toroid-like pattern. And I've seen them put in exactly the wrong place, like right above uh, the talent area, you know, with the null looking straight down on the talent. And they happen to work. And one of my rules of thumb is, hey, if it works, don't change it. But nevertheless, the antennas weren't really in the right place. And the directional antennas, which everyone loves, uh, and there's lots of them out there, paddle, shark fin, bat wing, whatever you want to call them, these are log periodic dipole arrays. And they're directional, they're typically wideband in their pickup. They might go from, let's say, 450 to 850 megahertz, something like that, depending on the physical size of the antenna. I've seen large ones. I think uh, Radioactive Designs has a huge one that looks like a medieval weapon of some kind. Um, and it's large because it's in the VHF frequency range. Then I've seen little tiny ones. I think Sure has one in the 2.4 gig range that's, you know, quarter the size of, of this one. 
And these antennas typically have about four to six dB of gain in the forward direction. And then they have a decent null to the back. In the lateral plane, they have a cardioid pickup pattern. And in the vertical uh, plane, you see they have more like a hypercardioid pickup pattern. So again, one of the tricks is to point the null towards sources that you don't want. Uh, you know, most people can figure out to point it towards what you do want, but uh, by pointing the nulls towards things you don't want, you can increase your signal to noise by several dB, and that can really make a difference in reliability and range. So, but the other thing about these antennas, they're, they're not laser beam pickups. Uh, so you can see that, you know, the cardioid pickup pattern has a fairly wide acceptance area, let's say maybe 75 degrees to the forward, and uh, the covers, it can cover a pretty wide area at distance. So that's something to keep in mind. So some rules of thumb, you know, Peter, along with talking about having a cluster of antennas at the console, uh, one problem might be that there's a lot of people in between those antennas and the talent that they're trying to reach. So, you know, best practice really is to get the antennas up fairly high. Uh, 10 feet is a good rule of thumb. I mean, it could be eight, it could be 12. And pointing at the talent, uh, as, you know, Lloyd Kincaid of Yamaha often said, you know, point the speakers at the audience. You know, that sounds obvious, but in, in this case, point the antennas towards the talent. And second, and you mentioned also the diversity spacing needs to be at least a wavelength. And, you know, Henry Cohen mentions it should be much more than that, actually, to have them not interact at all and have a really, uh, you know, the best diversity performance. And Pete, you mentioned having them on either side of the stage as an example. All these things are good. Uh, the secondary issue to watch for beyond line of sight is the Fresnel zone. And the illustration there really shows something like a TV tower and the buildings that might cause shadowing because of that issue. But anything that's large and that reflects or absorbs RF that impinges on uh, the signal can reduce range. So once again, imagine people on a stage or set pieces that might uh, be made with chicken wire on the inside, that kind of thing that might block or reflect the RF. You wanna be careful that they don't impinge too much on, on your signal. So again, 10 feet of height for your antennas is a good rule of thumb. Can't always be practical, but uh, you should do the best you can. And the picture that you see here, this is from the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. And they've got it set up with vertical displacement for diversity rather than horizontal. And it's totally legit. As long as each antenna sees a different collection of reflections and direct signal, uh, you'll, you'll be in good shape diversity wise. Pete, any other thoughts on this? The only thing about those pictures, I would guess they were fairly close to the stage. And yes. I would like to see a little bit of a tilt on them, sort of aim them. I would typically aim them two thirds of the way across the stage. Yeah. Uh, to do that, and and the, uh, the the reason I put antennas on both sides of the stage is then if I have a better chance of picking somebody up if they're on both either side of the stage even if I'm running a 200 foot cable to the other side of the stage. Yeah, makes sense. And you know, with, with good quality cable and maybe an RF boost, you know, 200 feet is not out of the question. And then I, I almost never use amplified antennas. If I need to amplify a cable, I will put an amplifier at the receiver. So then any high RF noise floor at the antenna is not just being exacerbated by an amplifier in the antenna. Yeah, it's interesting and different people do that differently. And you've got a good reason why I think Staffo typically likes to put them in the middle of a cable. Uh, you know, some cable attenuation is what you're talking about where the signal yep. will drop before hitting the amplifier. And RF amps and RF receivers have a, you know, a gain range. We talked about gain structure. And uh, it's just as important with RF as it is with audio. And we'll, we'll get a little more into that, but this is the issue here is cables have loss and different types of cables you know, can have different amounts of loss. We're showing the loss at 700 megahertz, which is becoming less relevant. Uh, the lower the frequency, the less the loss. When you get up to the 2.4 gig range, of course, the loss is much greater with these same cables. But down at 450, you're not quite an octave below 700, but close. So the, imagine these figures being a few dB less lost than what we're, what we're showing here. Uh, this kind of material is, is readily available from the manufacturers on the spec sheets for the cable. 
And there's lots of tables out there that you can look up. I mean, if you do a Google search for RF coax cable loss, you'll come up with tables that look just like this with a lot of detail at different frequencies, a bunch of different manufacturers, model numbers, and so on. This is good information to have at hand because RF gain, again, matters quite a bit. But uh, the rule of thumb is that uh, you want to have unity gain through your antenna system and no more than that. A very common problem, one of the most common, you know, Pete, you mentioned seeing antenna placement being such a uh, widespread problem. Uh, next, I think, is too much RF gain added uh, to signals and uh, people expecting to get better range and better reliability as a result of that. And they're baffled when it doesn't work that way and they actually have less range or it, it, you know, reduces their reliability. And again, that's because receivers have a certain amount of RF range uh, of signal level that they want to see, just like a mic preamp. You know, you hit a mic preamp too hard with a really hot mic and it's going to overload something. And that's that's possible with RF. You put too much RF into a receiver and it's going to overload, which causes a bunch of intermodulation uh, products and, uh, and can desensitize the unit and reduce range. So here's a simple formula. You know, your antenna gain, if it has any, and an RF amp gain, cable loss, splitter loss if using passive splitters, and uh, that's how you can work through this. And it's pretty simple math, but you want to make a little block diagram of each component in the chain and figure out if it's got gain or loss and how much and does, does it make sense. I typically, like you, Pete, I believe in passive antenna systems and uh, use them anywhere you can and don't add any amplifiers if you, unless you absolutely have to. And I'm happy and I feel like systems work really well with up to 6 dB of loss through the antenna system which is, you know, it's not very much in the big picture, rather than adding an amplifier to try to get it back to zero. Now, you go more than 6 dB of loss, maybe you could start looking at adding boost, but not much before that. Do you have a rule of thumb like that, Pete? Uh, pretty much pretty much that. I do want to see on my receivers no indication of RF when the transmitter is off. Right. If you've got too much gain, the first thing you'll start noticing is got a one or two little LEDs lit up indicating you've got a little tiny bit of noise. Now, that could be just a high noise floor. Yeah. Um, occasionally, if I'm in a place with a high noise floor, I actually will attenuate the antenna a little bit yes. to get the, get the receiver clear. Uh, the, another thing is maybe look for a different frequency that has a place with a lower noise floor because that's where you're going to get the most range out of your transmitter if you have a frequency that's totally clear. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that makes total sense. That's a great way to look at it. And the key here, just like with any audio, you know, signal to noise is really what you're looking for. You know, as long as with most wireless systems today, as long as you've got, let's say, 6 or 8 dB, which isn't very much, above a noise floor at your lowest dips, then you're gonna be solid. And trying to make you know, more and more RF at the receiver isn't necessarily gonna get you any better results. Uh, so think signal the noise as much as anything. And again, the receivers wanna see a certain level of RF and no more than that. And uh, by setting those things up properly, you'll have, you'll have good results. We so, do have a question uh, about yeah. interference between transmit and receive antennas. Mm -hmm. You understand? why they shouldn't be close together but how important is it to not have the cables next to each other for long distances and yeah, I, that that I, doesn't worry me very much but I, go ahead. it doesn't really mean too much however i do take an effort to not if i'm running a 200 foot cable and it happens to be only 100 feet out i don't leave the cable in a coil right there because that's yeah. going to affect i will take the cable and run it back and forth for 50 feet so yeah. it's never in a coil the coil will uh, affect the rf yeah you're in, in a sense making a giant choke exactly uh, you know and and not only that but there can be induced noise into that coil as well so yeah that's i agree a with you. that's a henry cohen suggestion that's where mm -hmm. i learned it yep it's sort of like, you know, if you got mic lines and AC lines, you, you want to cross them at 90 degrees. So the least amount of induced noise uh, into the mic lines, just little rules of thumb. That's a great suggestion, though. Thank you. So here's an example RF gain structure. And I've put an active splitter in here that has 0 dB of, of gain of insertion loss. And on the left there is our ALP690 
active antennas. Uh, they have 4 dB of passive gain approximately at these frequencies and about 12 dB of active, which is the max amount of gain that they allow for. Then I've got 150, 100 feet of RG58, which loses 12 dB. Then I go into an active splitter, a few short jumpers, and my two receivers. Uh, the, the problem here is that there's more gain than we need through the system, and there's even more gain hitting the active splitter, which probably has some headroom, but I tend to like to be conservative on that end as well. So, you know, we see here that these are not ideal. Too much gain gets to the receiver. So the alternate would be to uh, take that down by 6 dB at the antennas, and uh, then now we're hitting the active splitter at minus 2 dB, and the system is much happier like that. I would tend to never use an RG58 for any cable longer than 10 feet. I'd always I'd use agree. LMR400 or something like that because you might want that loss, but I'd rather insert the loss myself than, than have to deal with a cable that has a lot of loss in it. And that being said, just because the specs say your cable has a certain amount of loss, don't believe it test it with your spectrum analyzer to make sure it meets specs. Yeah, you need a tracking generator on your spec end, but it's a great uh, tool. And it's something that you, in my opinion, you should test your cables often because if they get damaged, crimped, shut in a door, yeah. run over by a forklift, whatever, uh, they will begin to lose uh, their, their qualities and uh, need to be replaced or repaired. Yeah, it's, it's really true. I think the longest uh, cable we sell with any cable material like that is 15 feet for that very reason. So low loss cable is definitely the way to go. And the other thing too is not all active distros are equal. I mean, in general, the low cost ones, if you wonder how they get it down to you know $400 or something like that, it's, it's not gonna have as much um, headroom. And so what you wanna look for is, is the IP3 figure, which is, represents third order intercept. And on our units, it's 27 dBm, which is pretty high. It's towards the higher end. Uh, and also look for any gain or loss or insertion loss in, in the splitter because some have some amount of gain, which you have to factor in to your calculations. Uh, and so what is third order intercept? It's really a hypothetical point. Uh, and and you, you, know, you can look it up. There's Wikipedia entries on it if you want to have an idea what it is. It just gives you an idea of how much headroom uh, these units have. And receivers have this figure as well. But notice that any RF amps will typically have like uh, plus 20 something dBm on the way in and plus 30 or 40 on the way out. Uh, but you wanna look at those figures to make sure that it's gonna be able to handle the signals that you're putting through the system. So here's another diagram that uh, uh, we, we started showing years ago and I recently resurrected because it's, it's germane. Uh, let's say you've got 500 feet of distance between the transmitter and a receiver, and that's quite a bit. Let's say that's uh, at a football game, a referee at the far you know corner of the of the field, uh, and then the receivers somewhere off the field, something like that. And uh, so, you know, that's quite a bit of distance. It might seem to make sense to run a long low loss cable out to the middle of somewhere and put an antenna on it. So you've got because of inverse square law, you've gained 6 dB. Uh, but then because of the loss through the cable, even this expensive low loss cable of 9.5 dB, you're actually getting less signal to the receiver than you were before. So one possible solution is to go to a directional antenna, which gives natural gain of, let's say, 4.5 dB or so. Um, and then what I don't show, of course, is that you could also, of course, put the directional antenna on the front end of that cable, uh, which may work well also. But this is just an illustration that the inverse square loss through the air is not going to match your, your linear loss through the cable. And it's always a good idea, again, to do a block diagram and figure all this out before spending a bunch of money or you know, loading a truck uh, with the gear. Don't make assumptions, just do the simple math. Then filtering, that's the next really important thing. And um, our whole team at Electrosonics, you know, our mantra in the last year or so has been you know, filter and attenuate. Pete, just like you said, you'd rather attenuate at your antennas and uh, and get a, a little bit of a lower signal in through the whole thing and giving everything plenty of headroom. 
And because the noise floor has come up and there's so many high power sources now quite close to our frequency bands, uh, this is something that uh, you want to take a look at. So one example, and there's many out there, this is a one block uh, filter that we sell uh, block by block. It has pretty low insertion loss and it's a very tight filter and they're not that expensive. These are just BNC. They can go in an somewhere in an antenna cable uh, between your uh, antennas and your receivers or between your antenna and your distro or between your distro and your receivers, something like that. So someone the other day on, I think it was on the Electrosonics Facebook group, posted a link to a device that goes wideband from 470 to 700 megahertz. And then someone replied with that with a link to the professional wireless systems units. That they have some that are made just for our industry that go from 470 to like 615 megahertz. And that's great. So passive filters can be a really good tool to keep all the other crap out uh, that you don't want coming in. And someone asked me the question, well, don't your receivers have filtering built in? And the answer is yes, of course they do. Uh, they wouldn't work otherwise. But adding another layer of passive filtering often can really help knock out the out of band uh, strong signals from TV or walkie talkies or you know, the new uh, 5G type uh, services things like that up in the 600 band. We don't want that stuff getting in, so we've got to filter it out before it gets into our system at all, and that'll definitely improve your performance. Actually, the receivers usually have an unfiltered section at the front end. The very so front if end, you yes. keep, If you keep the frequencies that are adjacent to your channel out, the front end works better and is more sensitive. Much so, yes. Right. That's a, we did that's have a... We did have a couple more questions on running cables. Okay, go ahead. Let's do uh, that because, yeah. Uh, can you talk about running antenna cable near power? Like Generally, at, it's at not the very least running through the next same hole as a sockaplex. Right. Yeah, I've not found too much trouble running them. Uh, you know, again, if you can cross them at 90 degrees, that's great. Uh, if you can separate with a couple feet, it's fine. Um, yeah. But because you don't have audio uh, on these cables, it's generally not too much of an issue. And if they're running parallel to each other, there's not that much induced noise for this type of system. But good practice is good practice. If you can separate them, do so. Right. Um, Carlos Corral asks, are the RG58 cable runs more than 10 feet due to the fact that sound mixers are being placed further away from the talent when it comes to being on a TV film production set? My mm -hmm. feeling is I like to get the antenna close to the performers and don't count on the RF going long distances through the air. But your last diagram you just talked with actually is the opposite. Yes, well, you know, again, it, it's gonna depend on doing the math and figuring out which is better. But one thing that this diagram does not account for is if there's noise uh, in between uh, your desired, you know, transmitter or your talent and your receiver. If there's a bunch of stuff going on here, uh, I would say that it's going to be a better idea to have something like this. But again, use a directional antenna before the cable to overcome some of that loss. And depending on the length of the cable, you know, 250 feet is quite a long ways, uh, but certainly manageable. But notice we have 9.5 dB of loss. Um, these antennas have variable uh, gain, so you can overcome some of that loss if you absolutely have to. So again, it's it's always going to be an it depends, and uh, you want to know how much loss your cable exhibits and how much gain your antennas might add, or what kind of boost you might be able to apply if need be. So it's never you know there's never one answer for that. It's it's very much situation dependent. There was a couple of questions about testing your cables if you don't have expensive test equipment. Uh, hopefully you have at least a spectrum analyzer, and if you use your transmitter, set a transmitter for 500 meg or so, measure it on your spectrum analyzer a couple of feet from the antenna, plug your antenna in, run the antenna out away from way away, put the transmitter out there and measure it out there and see how much loss you have added yeah. to that. Yeah. That's the that, that simplest way sense. to do it. Totally. Just keep the distance consistent, keep everything else the same, and then you know, switch in your your long cable for the short one and be sure that you know how much loss you expect from the cable and uh, then right. take a look and see if it matches right. that. And if not, you'll notice it. I mean, it'll it'll be 
if the cable's really been damaged, it'll be a dramatic amount of loss. It's a little harder to tell the subtle loss, but um, you know, if you look carefully at the gradations on the spectrum analyzer, you should be able to tell. I use a Keysight Field Fox, which has a built-in distance default analyzer. So I can plug that into a cable with an antenna on the end of it and measure the entire loss of the cable, not running it loop back to me, but the entire loss of the cable, plus see any little bumps along the middle, maybe the cable had been bent and it's causing a reflection. Right. So it, that's the ideal way to test your cables. And I, it, the nice thing about it is you can do it while they're installed on a show. Right. One yeah, more Pete, question. We'll, we'll pull some, uh, some stuff together, Pete, on that, because we've got this question now a number of times. So I think uh, for everybody listening, we'll work on compiling some cheapest, to most expensive solutions that yeah. are out there. And, uh, you know, there we go. That's great. Bill McMillan says back on band planning, uh, good luck on a film set getting band planning between camera lighting, technocrane, et cetera, and sound. Well, it sounds like maybe, I would guess, on in the film business, overall co RF coordinators are not normally hired for a shoot. Correct. Every different department is sort of on their own. And I yeah. would I would lobby against that. Right. Somebody should be an overall RF coordinator. On a TV show uh, that I normally work on, if a band comes on, I do the whole band. I do all the guitars. I do all the singers. I do all the mics for the lectern, whatever. All the wireless is the only way to have a control over it. If I were doing a, a bigger show where there's a lot of different vendors, I might have them say, tell me what equipment you have. I'll tell you what frequencies you can use. And typically, I'll give them a bunch of spares to start out with. Yeah, in the well-run studios, you find that as well. Is there's somebody who does get that and uh, does allocate frequency areas, but it's a little more rogue, uh, especially on location. You know, and I totally understand where he's coming from. Uh, and that's the case in a lot of like festivals too. There's no general central coordination, and it makes it very tough. Uh, but it's one reason to have a flexible a flexible plan. You know, let's say yeah. those uh, filters, for instance, you know, is have a, a pair of these for each block and uh, be ready to employ them. If there's someone who's got a hot signal that's right in the middle of the band of one of your receiver systems, maybe you want to block all that out and use just a portion of what of the range that you have. So it's real challenging, though. I think the future is going to be more and more overall coordination uh, and we have to push for it. It's another thing we have to diplomatically uh, work towards achieving in our industries. I think if 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 you're able to do it on a couple of shows, I think the TDs and the producers will notice that things run a lot smoother. Yeah, you know, and, exactly. and I I've even gone on shows where people have said, "No, I do my own coordination," and I was able to convince them to let me do that. And after the show, they said, "I can't believe how well my stuff worked <laughs> when you did the coordination." Yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had the same thing. I had a monitor guy say, you know, I've never been on a show where I didn't have tons of tr trouble with the inner yep. monitors. And, yep. I, and and so thank you, because I just given him a list, like, here's your frequencies. Oh, really? Yeah, just dial these in and we won't have any problems. And boom. Monitor and engineers like can, hear, can hear better than dogs, I say. And so yeah. I was oh, yeah. super test all the in-ear monitor frequencies myself. And, yep. and if they say they don't like a frequency, I don't argue with them. I just change right. the frequency. But yep. They're hearing something that I could never hear. Um, yeah, they're the closest uh, thing to the artists, and, and they exactly. can translate artist speak into tech speak, and it's a very important role. Exactly. Uh, Nat Corrin asks, where do people like to place the filters? At the antenna, at the RX, or are they RF amps? It's a matter of personal preference, like Carl said about Stafo. Right, and I think... It's situation dependent. Again, it depends on your gear and exactly what frequencies your your receivers will tune to. Um, if all you need is the band within that filter, uh, then go ahead and put them right at your antennas because you want to block out everything before it ever gets to your uh, distro, before it ever gets to any RF amps or before the receiver, certainly. But in some cases, you might have a couple different pieces of equipment that need to be tuned to different ranges like that one diagram that I showed. In which case you might have the these filters in between your distro and your receivers as an example so and, and again it depends on the, the filter the ones here i'm showing are one block wide but 
like the one I mentioned from professional wireless systems is six blocks wide. So you might put that right after the antennas, blocking out everything but the, the band that we're concerned with. And then maybe you'll use even more filters in between your distro and your receivers. So, you know, again, it's it's more about the system that you're trying to build and exactly what you're trying to accomplish as to where the filters might go. The more RF you have on a show, the more channels you have, the more advantageous filtering will do to you. I Absolutely. did a show with 80 microphones and I ran the the two antennas on the stage into a splitter and then out of the splitter into band pass filters for each band I was working in and into another antenna DA and then to the receivers. So each one was isolated from every other one and yep. it made for an extremely quiet uh, noise floor. Yes, absolutely. So filters one, more and more, filter and attenuate. Yeah. Yeah, one last question before we go on. Bill yeah. McMillan said, if you had multiple blocks working in a sound card, would you use only LPDAs or a combo of SNA 600 plus LPDAs? Yeah, you know, when I see mixers, again, it's kind of personal choice. I tend to want what I would call a balanced pair of antennas. So the same type on both legs, uh, giving about the same amount of gain uh, from the source so that, you know, diversity can work as best as possible. But I see a lot of mixers doing one of each, and you know I kind of look at the two antennas as being different tools. That you've got one that's picking up a wider area, but maybe not as much distance, and then your your uh, antenna that's got a directional pattern is going to give you a little bit more gain and a little bit more directionality uh, for the longer reach. Uh, but is that a diversity pair? It certainly works that way uh, when people use it, uh, but that's not what I would personally do. But I see it used a lot, and it and it works fine. So again, personal preference. Good. All right. So here's this example, of kind of what we we're just talking about, filtering block by block. That you know, if these are one block filters, you know, you're adding these between your distro and your receivers on your uh, on the receive side. So this way, that any noise that's coming in to the antennas out of band is going to be attenuated greatly before getting to the receivers. And Pete, just like you said, this is going to reduce the overall noise floor that your receivers see, which is really the key. You know, Stoffel always says, see the world through the eyes of the receiver and work from there. And this is an example of that. All right, any other questions about that before we get into a little bit about frequency coordination? Uh, one just came through from Paul McDermott. Uh, what's the advantage of using thinner cable on your short patches in a rack? Um, well, when there's no loss really involved, it's easier to handle a thinner cable in a rack. That's really yeah, only. it's much less cumbersome. Thinner cables are more flexible, and they don't take as much room or as much weight. Um, I, I I often use BNC cables made out of RG174, which is only an eighth of an inch in diameter. Exactly. And if it's too. only yeah. going two feet, it's no problem. Yeah, it's almost no loss. Uh, you might lose one dB, as shown in those diagrams. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's much more convenient than trying to run heavy cable uh, and bend it and, and you might damage it. That stuff's, uh, it can be troublesome. Would you okay. use filters on the transmit side? I have done that too, sure. It, you know, knocks out any, uh, you know, these days, honestly, though, with the tighter regulations on transmitters, they, we have to meet the Etsy standards. Transmitters are much tighter than they once were. Um, but it can also help knock down uh, intermodulation. Uh, Keep coming stuff out of, out of the transmitter. Yeah. Exactly, keep stuff out of it and from coming back out of it. So yeah, it can help. Yeah. All right, so frequency coordination, I think a lot of people do understand it fairly well now. It's it's a topic that let's say 10, 15 years ago, it was uh, black magic. Uh, but now with all the computer programs out there uh, from various manufacturers as well as third parties, you know, it's not that much under, you know, it's not that much misunderstood. Nevertheless, I wanted to explain what it is and why we do it. Basically, with any nonlinear device, and that's going to be an RF amp, a receiver, a distro, anything with active circuitry in it, when the radio signals go through, there's the potential that intermodulation frequencies are generated in that process. So when you mix more than one signal together, you get some in difference tones and you get intermodulation frequencies. So here's an example showing 650 and 670 coming in, and then the sum of difference. Uh, frequencies which are out of our range of concern for the most part. But then there's third order intermodulation frequencies that are coming in at 630 and 690. 
and that could be well within the band we're concerned with. Now, of course, I need to redo this diagram to show everything at, in the 500 meg band because we don't have very much access to 600 anymore, but you get the general idea. So, you know, with only two frequencies, let's say you're on the moon and you have two wireless transmitters, this might be what the intermods look like. But when you're down here on Earth where we have thousands of frequencies going all the time, you know, it's a much bigger challenge. And, uh, you know, so there's math to do. And, you know, back in the old days, people might use an Excel spreadsheet to do their frequency calculations. Uh, but these days, you know, there's software. And one of the industry standard softwares is IAS from Professional Wireless Systems. And it's a very good package. It's not free, it's not even cheap, but it's really good. And I've used it for many, many years. And uh, I think this is something you find on a lot of shows. Um, but to show you what we're talking about here, this is a, a calculation with 40 frequencies, which is not atypical at all anymore. And we see that there's potentially more than 2 million intermod frequencies. So it becomes very difficult to simply guess or throw darts at the dartboard. And I see that as a common problem is people sort of just guess and they say, hey, I'm, I'm getting uh, hits on channel three. Can you, can you play with that frequency? So they might move that around and retune it and say, yep, channel three is clean now. But all of a sudden channel six is starting to take hits. What just happened? How did that get affected? Well, this is exactly why is that now you might have a, a third order intermod, a fairly strong one falling on a channel six. So the software is gonna calculate all those relationships and give you frequencies which will not interact. That's really the key. I had a problem when I had shows with BTRs on them as well, mm -hmm. because the BTR receiver is very loose in its reception. It will just lock on to the nearest frequency to it. And if there was an intermod even appropriately spaced away from the received side of a BTR, if it was loud, if it was powerful, like for instance, the uh, wireless mic on a bass guitar, it would bleed through the uh, BTR system right away. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's a, another example of all the different sources you gotta keep in mind. <laughs> you know, yep. Guitar wireless, that's another one, or the sax player, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, there's the third party software like IAS that I showed you, and IAS is a very powerful tool, it's a great tool, but it's, it's an offline uh, calculating tool for doing pre-planning. So most uh, manufacturers, us included, of course, have our own software packages that do online connection to the equipment to use the equipment for scanning purposes. And then they can do intermod calculations and uh, band planning, as well as monitoring your system. So Wireless Designer is one such program. It's uh, free from us. You can download it on our website and it's available to uh, mount on the Mac platform as well as the PC platform. We went for many years with PC only and of course, Never heard the end of it until we finally came out with a Mac version about a year and a half ago. So we have it now. Really a powerful program. I'm gonna hook up a little bit later and, and show you uh, how that works and take you through a couple steps with it. So uh, transmitter placement is another real issue that comes up quite often. And especially now with the little tiny transmitters that we're seeing from everybody, we've got our little tiny SSM that's about the size of a Zippo lighter. And because of that, these transmitters can be hidden in places that, you know, you didn't used to be able to fit a transmitter. So what I'd like people to do is, uh, you know, kind of critique this and say, well, what's good and bad about this placement? So people want to kind of type in comments and uh, Pete, if you've got your thoughts on this uh, placement, uh, let's hear it. I would be fine with that. Uh, what I don't like is to see it in the small of the back particularly if you don't have control of what kind of chair they're sitting in. I had a show where a guy was sitting in a metal chair and every sat down his, his, his RF would go away. Often uh, I'll put the transmitter between the shoulder blades, particularly if it's a, a woman needs to have a transmitter on, I'll clip it onto the back of their dress up high near their shoulder blades if they don't mm -hmm. have a belt. Yeah. And uh, not RF, but... What about issues with sweat? Well, that's almost something you have to be concerned with. Uh, uh, this is depends on what the situation is. If we're in uh, in a really hot place and the guy's wearing a coat like he is there, you might want to uh, at least maybe mount it upside down. Right. 
Well, one of the things to watch for with all of this is RF attenuation. And if, uh, like you said, a hot place wearing a jacket, you know, the, uh, the shirt might get sweaty and having the antenna touching a, a sweaty undergarment or even worse skin uh, can be a real problem. So there's a lot of tricks to solve that. You know, years ago, Stoffel pointed out you could use like aquarium air tubing, make a little uh, air insulator, if you will, to slip it over the antenna. People would be shrink straw. tubing for that. Just put a straw uh, on it. A straw, sure. A little foam pad that's cut to uh, to dimension. You know, so all these things are uh, important to watch for. And in theatrical uh, efforts and maybe some rock touring, you got to watch out for metallic fabrics. Uh, it might look really cool, but it might attenuate RF. Uh, so just watch for all of those things with your transmitter placement. And you mentioned this on small of the back as an example, uh, that this may create a fairly distinctive uh, polar pattern with so much absor absorption from the body. And worst case with this might be if you had your receiving antennas at front of house where they're picking up, you know, they have to pick up signal through the body. And, you know, your example of using antennas on either side of the stage uh, would solve this almost no matter where the guy is standing or, or you know, how their body is oriented. Uh, the At least one of the receiver antennas is going to get a nice strong signal. So let's look a little bit about audio. Uh, gain structure because with a wireless mic, you're adding potentially up to two or maybe more in some types of systems uh, gain points in, in the signal chain uh, versus just plugging a hardwire into the console. So here you've got your, uh, your microphone connected to a transmitter, or if it's a handheld, it's a capsule into a, a, a transmitter. So there's, there's your mic preamp, really, is the transmitter itself. And then you're transmitting going to receivers and then those are gonna be connected to some other equipment like a mixing console or a recorder. And the output gain of your receivers needs to be considered and how you um, set up and what kind of inputs you plug into uh, are another issue. So, you know, I know a lot of sound mixers uh, at least years ago used to run their receivers at mic level output into a, a mixer or recorder at mic level in and their their logic and it makes makes sense is that they could unplug one of those things and plug a boom mic into it and not have you know uh, no gain uh, so however you know mixers run at line level and uh, wireless mic receivers run at line level so if you can avoid that drastic attenuation and then boost you can definitely improve your signal to noise but just be thinking about the multiple gain points that you've introduced by uh, putting a wireless mic in the chain. The key issue is that you want to have enough signal in the noise. You know, better and better wireless, and these days with digital wireless, the, the channel noise is very low. But nevertheless, you want to have enough of a signal to work with above that channel noise. So the trade-off, of course, is that you might be hitting the limiters of your transmitters on the inputs. In fact, you know, we include a, a, a card with uh, with each transmitter that kind of shows them or encourages them to turn up the gain far enough until where the peaks are going to tickle the limiters because that way you know you're getting a nice fat signal into the transmitter and then transmitted over the air and that way you've got plenty of signal to work with uh, but again today I think we're finding with digital transmitters that uh, you can back that off a little the noise floor of the system is so low that you can use a little bit less gain uh, but I would still tend to you know being an old school audio guy tend to Put a nice fat signal in the front end, just like we always had to do with, you know, in, in the recording studio, capture a fat signal. And then from there, you've got a lot of meat to work with, as opposed to a tiny signal that you have to boost and then use plugins to try to clean up and make quiet again at the end. You know, start with a, a good solid signal in the first place. So I kind of mentioned this, but, you know, what you don't want is to attenuate the signal heavily and then boost it again. Uh, because it's gonna bring additional noise in uh, and reduce your signal to noise. I think the one logic that people use on occasion though is they say, you know, I've got a particular kind of mixing console or my, my money channel with the singer is going through a Neve preamp or whatever it is and that, that's a mic preamp. So we wanna run the, the output of the receiver at mic level, come into this preamp, it gives it this warmth or this particular kind of color that they, that they like. And that's totally legitimate. I mean, what we're doing is the arts. Uh, you wanna create a sound. Uh, and, and I get all that, uh, but just be aware that you're sacrificing a little bit of signal to noise. Again, it may not be an issue, but something to keep in mind. 
So the other thing is to keep in mind is like maintenance uh, for your system. And these are all common problems, you know, sweated out labs, everyone's dealt with that at some point or another, you know, and, and the, the good quality labs are, are real money. Uh, and to think of them as a, a, an expendable can be hard to swallow, no, no question. But it really is true that they will have a certain amount of life. The better you take care of them, uh, the, the longer they'll last. Uh, but nevertheless, and, and the, the manufacturers of lab mics are making them tougher and longer lasting all the time. I mean, there's there's the heavy duty series uh, or, or, you know, from uh, DPA, for instance, you know, there's waterproof lab mics from Voice Technologies and Countrymen is an example. Uh, so there's plenty of great products out there and much of it is the sound that you like and the brands that you like to work with. But um, just keep that in mind that it's a common um, maintenance issue. And then of course, battery contact, uh, you know, dirt, corrosion, that kind of stuff. Battery management is a big deal, uh, especially nowadays going wireless, or excuse me, going rechargeable, is you wanna have a, a, a clear policy of how to take care of those batteries. Don't use the cheap quick chargers, for example. Make sure that you mark your batteries with their first charge date and, and that kind of thing, and replace them on a regular schedule because they, they don't last forever. But rechargeables are a great resource. They save a lot of money. They're better for the environment in general, uh, much less waste. Moisture damage, as we talked, it's uh, it's a prevalent issue. You're putting a small device on a on a human body, and uh, moisture is is always right around the corner. There are watertight transmitter units. They're a little bit rare and they're a little bit specialized, but they're out there. Um, and then there's ways of keeping uh, transmitters protected, such as unlubricated condoms. In fact. Once in a while, I see it going around that apparently there's a manufacturer that makes uh, black unlubricated condoms for the theater industry, just for that reason. So those are out there. Uh, and then aqua packs and things like that. Loose antenna connectors. I can't tell you how many times that you know I've heard, hey, we're uh, the system worked great and, and now the, the range sucks and we don't know why. And you start going through it and having them do all these little things. And sometimes people take offense when you say things like, did you check all your antenna connectors? Um, but it's routine troubleshooting that you just got to go through and look at those things. And we already covered damaged BNC cables. Illegal frequencies. This is uh, something we've had to deal with in the last 20 years as the spectrum's gotten gobbled up. Uh, but please be aware of uh, what the laws are and regulations in your region, your country, your part of the world. And certainly in the U.S., we know that most of the 600 band is off limits. Uh, except for a couple little guard bands and mid-band gap with very specific restrictions on them. Uh, but most of what we have these days is, you know, in the UHF band is 608, or excuse me, 470 to 608 megahertz. And then VHF, it's 174 to 216. So got to keep these things in mind. Very common uh, question that's come in in the last decade or so is, hey, my wireless has been working great until yesterday and it just got blown off the air. What's going on? Uh, you ask them, well, What's your what's your block? What's your frequency? Well, I'm in block 27. Well, that's in the 700 meg band, and uh, that's there's LTE there now, you know. So you got to be careful of these things. Any questions about that before we get into some of our unique technology? Pete, any other comments um, uh, about the maintenance? One, only one. Um, Ken Goodwin wants to know, are there any electoral guidelines for setting transmitter power compared to the environment, distance, et cetera? He has a lot of trouble with the engine crews wanting to always operate at full power all the time. Yeah. Yeah, well, our rule of thumb is the same as everybody else is, you know, only use as much power as you need. And I think that ENG crews are used to showing up at a, at a crowded event with a lot of things going on and a lot of unpredictability. And so they want to rely on the power as a way to cut through all that. It's not always appropriate, um, you know, and you can't always force another party to change their settings. Uh, but generally, you know, again, as long as the lowest dips in your system are still six or eight, or, you know, if you want a little margin, 10 dB above the noise floor, you should be solid, which may mean you run your systems at at 25 milliwatts or maybe 50 milliwatts it really depends could be lower than that but in general the more wireless you have in one place the lower power you want to run on each system uh, within reason and most manufacturers you know in the old days it was electro was always a high power we're sort of like the uh, you know the um, muscle cars you know a lot of power in a straight line kind of thing um, and some manufacturers they always believed in low power 
and uh, you know carefully um, selective receivers and so on, and lots of filtering. But I think we've seen a convergence where everybody's equipment now offers various power settings. And so, yeah, we, we recommend the same thing as everybody else. Only use the power that you need. Any uh, other what questions? I have noticed, what I've noticed is if you use high power in a small space, yeah. like, a, like a small room, you're hurting yourself tremendously. It's, your re reception is going to be terrible. If you turn your, turn your equipment down to 10 milliwatts, you'll work fine. Absolutely, yeah. Um, most of our uh, hybrid transmitters uh, these days are offering, in most cases, 25, 50, and 100 milliwatts, that kind of thing. 100 milliwatts isn't that often needed. Uh, outdoors on a film set, unpredictable environment, so yeah, sure, makes sense. You might need longer ranges. Um, and then our digital stuff is typically 50, 25, and 10 milliwatts, so, and that's gonna give you very similar ranges, all things being equal uh, to that uh, much higher power from an analog type system. Okay. Uh, no questions left. All right. Great. So um, many people have asked us this, how does digital hybrid wireless work? Uh, it is a unique technology and patented, and it's been in our line for the past 15 years. We got a, an award for it. And so first, I'm going to go in a little bit further back to the days of analog companders uh, to explain this. So a compander is going to be a lot like Dolby tape noise reduction. This is a compression and expansion uh, process where you have a wide dynamic range that you need to pipe through uh, something like tape or an RF channel that has a limited dynamic range. So you compress it on the transmission, transmit it, and then uncompress it on the other end. So this has been what we all did for decades uh, since the mid-70s. I think John Nady is the first one to employ that technology by borrowing it from the telephone industry. Uh, became standard practice. Everyone was doing it. Everyone was coming up with novel schemes. Uh, we had our dual band companding, uh, sure had audio reference companding, you know, everyone's got a fancy way to uh, compand the audio and make it come out the other end still sounding good. Uh, but nevertheless, just like tape noise reduction, there's potential for mistracking distortion. Uh, if you're using pre and D emphasis, you can run out of headroom on high frequencies, which is why, for instance, if the uh, singer's girlfriend came up on stage and uh, did a, you know, shook a tambourine into the lead vocal mic, uh, it sounded like a crunching bag of potato chips because the compander and the pre and emphasis did not like high frequency transients. In fact, that was one of the bane of many guitar players' existences, you know, that uh, wireless would just change their tone so much and change their dynamics. And this is part of the reason why. So we got uh, some clever folks in engineering and in particular, David Thomas uh, found some interesting older um, developments involving using predictive algorithms uh, to enhance the uh, robustness of wireless transmitted signals. And this is something similar to like what CEDAR does with noise reduction. They're looking at the difference between periodic and aperiodic elements, and uh, you can process them differently. So you do a fast Fourier transform, you separate these things. Uh, so any complex waveform is gonna come in and have all this stuff in it. Uh, so you use a DSP algorithm to separate the periodic and aperiodic elements. And then what we're doing then is transmitting only the aperiodic components, the details, the transients. Um, you know, we're all dealing with a limited pipeline through the uh, transmission process. And this is a way to maximize that pipeline by only transmitting the really fine details. And so then the receiver picks up that signal and reconstructs it um, if you want to look up quadrature mirror filter, uh, that's what this process is, is taking that um, component of the signal, of the total signal, and reconstructing the rest based on that information, and out comes the audio. So this is a way of really getting, you know, wide, wide bandwidth, high dynamic range through a wireless channel, and it's not a compander. It's, it's a, you could consider it a compander, I suppose, but it's a different process that can only happen in, in the digital domain. And uh, the results are, are excellent. Um, we, in fact, got an um, Academy Award for technology uh, for this, and I got to go up on stage. It was pretty wild uh, to be there. And, uh, and then when they showed the Oscars, you know, that this part of the ceremony, the technical part where people win for uh, their software and their cameras and all, that's what this was. It was a couple weeks before the actual Oscars. 
And then in a very short clip, about maybe a second or two, uh, I was on the screen. And man, my phone just lit up crazy on Oscar night because people saw that. And it was, it was quite an exciting thing. So that's uh, Dave Thomas there giving the acceptance speech and Dave Bunny, one of our transmitter designers. And I was there uh, accepting on behalf of Larry Fisher since he had retired from the company at that point. All right, so that's the technology we've had in our line for the last uh, 15 years or plus. And what's coming now, of course, is digital wireless is, is on everyone's lips. And uh, what's nice about it is digital gives us some different trade-offs. And that's the best way to look at it. I think everyone's aware of the what's called the engineering triangle. You know, you can have things, uh, if you're looking at uh, three axes, like good, fast, and cheap, that's the most common example. Uh, you can have it good and fast, but it's not going to be cheap, right? Uh, you can have it any one of those two things, but not three. So think about the RF trade-offs as being something like that. With digital, you know, we can do um, trade-offs between range, channel density, audio quality, and, and maybe battery consumption. And you can emphasize certain aspects of this with clever coding. And notice that some um, types of um, equipment actually give you more than one option. You have, a, let's say, a high density uh, choice versus a long range choice. Uh, those would be two things. And they're not necessarily compatible. And you might have a, a low compression or high audio quality uh, choice as well. With analog, of course, it was more about the hardware design. You know, the range versus battery life, audio quality, and channel density could be trade offs. And you might be able to get two of those to work really well, but it's tricky to get more than that without driving the cost up too, too much. So uh, uh, an important thing to think about is the difference of the modulation, because analog is typically, uh, typically going to be FM modulation, frequency modulation. And on the left there, you see an unmodulated analog signal. It's a narrow spike where all the energy is concentrated at the carrier frequency. And it looks like, hey, we could stack a whole bunch of those together, close to each other. The problem is that that's unmodulated, and what you really uh, need to do is look at full modulation to see how much bandwidth it really occupies in the heat of the battle. And frankly, it's going to look a lot more like the digital signal on the right, which is fully modulated all the time. So this is just something to really keep in mind that the two are, are uh, different animals. Digital is modulated fully all the time, kind of like Class A electronics. And on the left, you know, analog is only modulated when there's uh, speech or music going through that channel. And in general, the, the rule of thumb is these things occupy about 200 kilohertz, you know, plus or minus 100. Uh, the max deviation now allowed in the US is plus or minus 50 kilohertz. But as you can see, there's a little bit of noise skirts on these channels that spread them a little bit further at the base of the signal. Uh, Pete, any other comments here? Um on about frequencies, uh, Carlos Corral is asking, what about having to reblock transmitters and receivers? There's a lot of new wireless to come and some of the B1 frequencies starting to become crowded. Yeah, reblocking is typically available. He's talking about it's electrosonics equipment and he's in B1 yeah. and he's thinking about getting it reblocked to A1. Yeah, you want to just check with our service department. They'll give you a quote for that. What they're gonna do is replace the radio board in, the, in that system. And Eric asked, does sending the cable, antenna cable, on top of a scaffolding affect transmission power? Cable on top of scaffolding, generally no. No, not, it would not. It's not gonna have an issue. Um, and then can you speak to the difference between blue and black tag gear and why the change was necessary? Okay, yeah, that's a very specific electrosonics question. Happy to answer that. So the black tagged gear means that it is uh, compliant with the new rules. It's a device that has changed. Uh, in other words, let's say um, an HMA, that's our plug-on transmitter that's been available for several years now. You know, it was available before the change in the rules and it used to have plus or minus 75 kilohertz deviation. And then the rules kicked in and we had to change that's October 2018 is when the new rules kicked in. So for units that changed from one type of uh, deviation standard to another, we've changed the badge color to black, which means that if you have a black one, uh, then that tells you it's compliant with the new Etsy rules. If you've got a, 
a, a blue one means that it's before that and uh, it's going to have plus or minus 75 kilohertz. Your receiver settings need to be set properly to match that to avoid problems. And uh, the difference is that the old one was called NA hybrid or North American hybrid. That was the standard in Canada and the United States. And then after the change, it's NU hybrid or new hybrid. And EU hybrid uh, in the Europe, it's been plus or minus 50 kilohertz and uh, Etsy mask compliant for many years. So EU hybrid and NU hybrid are equivalent to each other. So if you've got a receiver that offers in uh, uh, EU hybrid, you can use that with your black badged units. Now, anything that's been made since that, like all of our digital units, they're already compliant with the new rules. They don't have to have a black badge. They're gonna have a blue badge. I hope that makes sense. But for anyone who wants to know all the details of that, there's something on our webpage. Uh, if you look up our wired lists, and look up Etsy compliance. There's a whole very detailed description of that very thing. Hope that answers your question. Anything else before we move on? Uh, there was one comment from Ken Goodwin. Um, no, that's really to Pete and Kelly. Never mind. Go on. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All right. So Latency is one of those things where we need to uh, think about that, particularly with, with digital systems. You know, in pure analog wireless, it's basically zero milliseconds. There may be a tiny amount of, of uh, delay induced in, in the audio processing, but essentially it's zero. Older digital systems can uh, have a decent amount of latency, some uh, quite a bit actually. And I know that there are systems out there with something like 18 or 19 milliseconds, uh, like the decked uh, wireless stuff that probably isn't usable for a live event. It's just too much latency. But you know, for, for like ENG on camera type stuff, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, digital hybrid wireless, uh, our system has 2.9 milliseconds of latency. The newer digital stuff, we're seeing that latency figure come down to half of what it once was. Uh, our D squared platform has 1.4 milliseconds. I've seen some other systems with 1.9. This is excellent. I think the, uh, the round trip is the thing to watch for. If people are using in-ear monitors, they're singing into a mic that may have latency in its own system. It may go through a console that adds a little more. There may be plugins, and then it goes back through in-ear monitors right back to the performer. And that signal coming through their ear is going to be mixed with their own voice through bone conduction in their own head. And if the latency is more than a few milliseconds, they're gonna start noticing a little bit of tonal shift because of comb filtering. So that's the thing to watch for. Normally with modern systems, they're not gonna hear a distinct delay um, unless it's Donald Fagan, uh, but otherwise, um, you know, just watch to keep that latency, that round trip latency to a minimum. And don't forget that uh, just because it's digital, that does not mean that uh, the signal does not incur more latency along the way. If there's any sample rate conversion, there's a little bit more latency added each time. So one rule of thumb is to use the, the highest common denominator. If all the systems can operate at 48 kilohertz, then that's what you wanna use because the, the conversion to, from 48 to 96 for the fancy console and back will actually incur more latency than you're saving by running the console at 96 kilohertz. So something to just keep in mind. Pete, any thoughts? No, I'm set. Keep going. Great. Sounds good. Oh, yeah, that one last thing there. Uh, if you're doing like Broadway theatrical where they have a lot of speaker zones and they're timing everything out, it's just a good idea to keep in mind that in, unlike a wired mic plugged into a stage box going to an analog console and then through the system, you know, everything being digital, it's going to add some latency on the front end and you want to factor that in to your speaker zone timings. So other audio issues that you may run into, you know, with analog, there was a graceful, I guess, or not, depending on the system, uh, decay. And, uh, you know, you could still get a signal. It might be a little noisy and a little rough, but uh, digital, you know, if, if you don't have enough signal to noise or enough signal integrity uh, at your receivers, you're not going to get anything. You'll hear maybe the tiniest instant of robotic noise, and then it's gone. Uh, and we see that with digital television as well. Digital IEMs. You know, they offer excellent channel separation, which means that you can use them in a dual mono capacity, like a, a single channel IFB with two audio channels on a single carrier. 
which is very difficult to do with analog because there's not enough channel separation. And then, as I mentioned, analog systems have companders, digital and hybrid do not. Uh, that may affect the sound quality in some circumstances, so something to think about. All right, so let's get into some of the meat of the Lectra system. Uh, most people have seen these, uh, but the, the probably the most popular receiver we make and sell is actually the SRC. This is a slot mount type unit. It's popular in bag systems. Uh, it's a standard for ENG for camera mount and really tiny. These things are not much bigger than a deck of cards and it's a digital hybrid and uh, two channels of independent wireless. And they're compatible with any transmitter in our line as long as it's a hybrid transmitter or older generation systems. So, and uh, Sony cameras don't offer two analog uh, audio inputs in the slot, so we have a 5P version that takes care of that with an external output. So probably what we're most famous for is we have a really wide variety of transmitters. Uh, most companies offer a handheld, a belt pack, maybe a small belt pack, um, but we've got watertight units, we've got various belt packs with different features. I don't want to go into all the details right now, it's certainly available on our website. Um, and then the plug-on, uh, which is really a cornerstone of our line that's used for the TM400, uh, by the way. That's a, a test and measurement system that's a single channel plug-on transmitter um, to be used with a test microphone and then a single channel receiver or a multi-channel receiver. That way you're wireless and you can measure your sound system output and whatever parameters using SMART or one of the other uh, software packages out there. And it's another indicator that the digital hybrid platform is so linear uh, that you can use it for test and measurement. It, it does have a little bit of latency, which you have to factor in, and it's not perfectly phase linear because of the high pass filter at the bottom end of the audio, uh, but those are easy to factor in. So the SM wideband family, this is kind of our um, flagship belt pack units right now. Uh, they have a lot of nice convenience features and uh, they're very, very small and with rounded edges, and they have onboard recording. These can either be used as a recorder or a transmitter, and they offer three power settings at 25, 50, and 100 milliwatts. Uh, our export units for Europe offer the 25 and the 50 only. These are made out of billet aluminum, um, you know, a single piece of metal that's milled out, and then the circuits are put in, so they're extremely tough. The SSM, I mentioned that earlier, this is the really tiny unit. It's still one of the smallest units out there. The only way we could make these this small was to use a different battery and use a LIMO connector, which was the first time that we've done that with Electrosonics. But, you know, LIMO 3 is definitely a standard out there, and we're seeing more and more units with them. I think ultimately it will be the standard, if uh, if you want my opinion. And these have a six-plus-hour runtime on a, on a LB50 battery, a rechargeable lithium-ion. Also a metal case milled out of a single piece of aluminum and then a heat treated uh, steel battery door. So in terms of digital stuff, uh, we've got this digital in-ear system out there that's used a lot for IFB as well as uh, fold back for performers and uh, on-air talent. Uh, and it's kind of unique because the transmitter accepts a Dante input as well as uh, analog. I believe it is the only in-ear system that accepts Dante inputs that's on the market. Uh, the receivers are quite compact. They run on two AA batteries. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you can run the system as a mono system. So you could pipe four mono channels into the transmitter. And then on two RF carriers, you've got four audio channels. And this is a really handy thing with the spectrum crunch the way it is. So this takes up half the number of RF channels uh, versus an analog type IFB. Then just last year, mid-year, we introduced the D-squared system. Uh, this is the receiver version, if you will, of the of the uh, duet system. Four channels in a half rack space, giving you very, very good rack density. And uh, we've got an, uh, the Dante outputs coming from this unit as well. And very soon we'll have a version that has AES-3 digital outputs. So stay tuned. You'll hear more about that very soon. And we've got transmitters as well, belt packs and handhelds, digital. Uh, really, really amazing sound quality from this system. And then just a few weeks ago, prior to, to what we thought was going to be NAB, uh, we introduced the IFB R1B. This is a successor to the very popular R1A IFB mono analog belt pack receiver. These units are about half the size and half the weight. They run on a rechargeable battery, 
And we now we have dock charging, which we never had before. So in terms of like news studios or any kind of uh, TV fast paced operation, uh, this should really be a handy uh, tool, especially the dock charging. Okay, any questions about that stuff before I do a little tour of wireless designer? And Pete, any other comments? No, we're set, go ahead. Great, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share a different screen. Let me get this going. Okay, you see that okay? We do. Great, okay, so Wireless Designer is our software that can be connected uh, by USB or network. In this case, I just have it connected to one of our Venue 2 multi-channel receivers by USB for convenience. And what the software is doing really is three different things. It allows you to do a frequency scan, which I did a little bit earlier. And this is gonna show us what the receiver sees on site. And we see some fairly strong television channels and a decent amount of room, especially up there in the, what is that? Like 555 to 575 meg is a nice piece of pretty clean spectrum. And uh, so it'll do a spectrum scan. Here we're monitoring all the channels that are connected and I don't have any transmitters on at the moment, uh, but we're seeing the native RF noise floor on these particular channels. And channel one and channel four look decent with low noise floors, but channel two and channel three don't look so hot. Now, if I were to turn on a transmitter, you'll see how that looks. And what we'll see is the RF signal get much stronger and it turn green and I see a blue link light. And within a few seconds, we'll see our battery level. And if I had a, a microphone connected, you would also see our audio level. So the transmitter I have here is a SSM, so it's showing a four volt battery. That's the LB50 rechargeable. And um, you know, from this panel, we can mute the audio on this channel. And notice also when I do that, it's showing you physically on the receiver which channel that is. And then, uh, Kind of the meat of this software is the frequency coordination part of it. And so what I've done is a local scan. I've got my four channels and we're seeing uh, some conflicts, just like you would expect based on uh, the, the high noise floor that we see over here. So there's a couple ways that we can fix that. And one of them is manually. And what I like to point out is if I'm gonna pick up and grab one of these carriers and start moving it around, notice at the bottom there, those orange uh, lines that are moving, those are our third order intermod products that might be generated between these transmitters. So as I'm moving this channel around, uh, the intermods are moving with it. So it's hard to see unless I get that thing to cross the line there where it's in the open, out in the open. So this would be true with any of these channels that the intermods that, I'm, that are potentially generated between these are gonna move as I'm moving these channels. So you wanna watch for that. But it's kind of a good education tool to see, oh, what happens to the intermods as I'm moving my frequencies? So I could do a hand tuning and I've moved those two channels into much better place. And so if I deploy that to my system, then now you'll see that noise floor has come down on those two channels. And that's generally what we wanna see. All right, so that's doing it by hand. Now, if I wanted to do it in an automated fashion, uh, my first thing would be to take the threshold here, this, this red line, grab it and pull it down as far as possible while still allowing for some cracks underneath it. Uh, so visually look at that and see what's in the scan and then do that. And now what I would do is just uh, coordinate selected channels. Now you can lock or unlock certain channels, which is very handy. I've locked channel one because that's the frequency that my little belt pack is on, so I'm gonna leave it there. Now, when I hit coordinate selected channels, it's gonna move those frequencies to what it thinks are the best places for them. And then I deploy the system. I'm gonna tune my receivers, done, and hopefully the noise floors stay nice and low on those channels. So yeah, it looked like actually channel four came up, so I'll have to take a closer look at that one. All right, so some folks have asked us about uh, bringing in uh, different scan data and the software now supports that. So I can actually import scan data from file. Here's a couple scans I did a couple weeks ago. So I can import those and that's in our own scan data files. 
but we can also now import CSV files. So here's a couple that I downloaded from a website uh, from the Gas Monkey Bar and Grill in, I believe, Texas, as an, as an example of a different scan. So I can actually bring that scan in, we'll import it, and there we go. So that's a much wider band scan than what we have here. Um, and it shows that if I was gonna use these frequencies for that particular location, that I would have conflicts. It's a different, different place, obviously, different state altogether. So there shows you a couple of examples. Now, another thing people have asked us about is, does this software support other manufacturers' equipment? And the answer is yes, by using custom channels. So this is a way to add channels that are offline, that are not connected. So they could be our own old wireless systems, like uh, let's say we're gonna do an IFB uh, channel here. It's, it's Electrosonics um, and it only offers 100 kilohertz steps and we'll put it in block 470. So it knows what range that is. I've now created this custom channel. It's part of my system and it will also be uh, included in the frequency coordination. It's a light blue frequency in this list. So now we see it in our list. It shows it's got a conflict. And why don't we go ahead and add uh, something else as well? And here we could add, let's say, um, a sure vocal mic, vocal. And we know that this is in the J1 band, so it's going to have a start frequency at uh, 545 megahertz and go up to 590. Okay. And that offers 25 kilohertz steps. So now uh, I've created that one as well. And it's in my frequency list and will be counted. It's actually right here. Okay. So this is a way that you can actually add other equipment into this and consider it in our coordination. So now with those things in the coordination, uh, we will coordinate these channels and it will find places for them and in the mix. All right, so that's bringing in other, other uh, stuff and <clears throat> they can be offline and now we see them, these custom channels. Uh, other people have asked also, is it possible to bring in a list like uh, from IAS? And yes, you can do that. Uh, this is import custom channels from file, and it's a similar process where I'm going to uh, pull in an IAS coordination list. And from there, you can merge those channels with your active channels. But you need to keep in mind that any frequency coordination program, it likes its own math, and it's not so fond of math from another program. So you may bring in a list, and it'll tell you there's a bunch of conflicts, even though you know well that's not the case. So something to keep in mind with any frequency coordination software. For instance, I could make a coordination with this software, export it as a CSV, bring it into IAS, and IAS won't like it. So that's one of the things we have to deal with in our business. Now, Pete, what software are you typically using for coordination? I use IAS all the time. And then uh, often, if I'm on a show with uh, Sure Equipment, I'll use Workbench to control the equipment, but I pretty much am IAS. Um, right. in, in, did you show us if where to uh, uh, enter another zone, maybe a zone where I might enter frequencies I have to avoid, but I'm not going to include in my intermod? Uh, we don't have zones in this version yet, but that's something okay. we're working on. Yeah. Okay. And then I love the fact that you've incorporated a way to import from IAS uh, I wish all everybody else would have that, or at least settle on one standard of of uh, export file. You know, it, it is about there's Sennheiser and Electro and and Sure and and uh, they're all slightly different. You know, so yes, yeah, it's good to be versed with all of them if you can be. Just from you know, mixed systems are the name of the game anymore, and you might find systems from all of us on a on a show. And to be at least right. basically versed. But you know, I, I was there, thinking. Oh, go ahead. Is there a, a place to import from a, a FCC database or anything like that where the channels are in a town? Not at this time, no. 
Okay. So basically you do your scan and work it work straight from the scan, which is the way I do all the time anyway. Dollars to donuts, the data on the FCC database isn't correct. I'd rather yeah. just do my scan and go there, go from there. It's very true, but you, what you can do is if you know that there's active TV channels in your area, you can enable them here, and it will then oh, okay. consider that hot and avoid blocks it. Blocks it out, right. It and that's channel out. 37 that's blocked out right there, the red yeah, the bars. Yeah, one with the red stripe, that's exactly right. right. That's an exclusion right. zone, of course. And I think you know one way that you could do what you're talking about with the zones is you could deselect uh, these channels and it won't move them, or or you could also lock them and and they would be considered in the calculation but not be allowed to move. So it might be a different way of thinking than what you're talking about with the zones, but it's one way to possibly no, do what you're saying. No, well zones, I'm just thinking is you might want to make another zone to include frequencies from the theater next door. Sure, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. not going to coordinate, but you sure don't want to step on them. Uh, is there any way to do inclusion and exclusion groups? We're working on that too. That's coming okay, up. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, it looks very nice. I like it a lot. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's 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 already evolved quite a bit and it's always a work in progress. But the idea of like sequestering an area and, and like you said, exclusion zones and things like that, that, that's coming. So that's just a quick overview. A um, couple other things about it. The settings, this is where you would possibly, uh, you know, do your network stuff. Uh, you could, depending on the hardware, turn on and off your antennas. Uh, we have tuning groups uh, that you might uh, save. Like I know a lot of reality television uses uh, tuning groups because they're they're moving their crews around and interfacing with different talent. Uh, you could look up your versions and see if everything is current by comparing it to the list on our website. So like I said, there's your network settings and lock out your front panel. Well, that may be something you want to do on an installation, for instance. So it's really a lot going on with the software. I don't want to spend too much time here. In fact, I want to mention that I did a whole software tutorial with a lot of detail recently as a Facebook Live session. And then afterwards, uh, I think it was Jason Glass told me that, hey, did you know that your drop-down menus weren't showing? And so we went back and re-edited it by recreating everything that was in there and making screenshots of it and editing it into the video. So <laughs> it's all in there now, and it's on our YouTube page. In fact, we put those four uh, those four sessions including the one with wireless designer they're called wireless side chats and they're on YouTube and they're in a playlist so you can watch all of them if you like but you know we kind of start with spectrum intro and then get into best practices and then into wireless designer and then more detail on like bag systems so that's a nice resource that's up on our YouTube channel which is just uh, YouTube slash electrosonics and this wireless designer is on your website for anybody to download it is exactly. Just look on the website, look under resources, and there should be a direct link to Wireless Designer where you can look at the revision history and cool. download the version for Mac or PC. Great. And I just uh, created uh, two handouts that you guys can find in there. One has a link to their website with the filters that they provide because there was a lot of discussion around that, as well yep. as another slide that has uh, hyperlinks to both the Mac and the PC version of Wireless Designer. So it's in your handouts right now. It'll Fantastic. Be in the video so i'll let you uh continue forward on your topics great i'm going to head back over to the deck here and get into this stuff i've got a couple of questions that are totally off topic um yeah go ahead uh it would be great to see a version of d2 with a fifth dante output channel so we don't have to give an output for talkback that's just Message a request heard. yes message uh, received bringing this back to closer to what we're talking about right now, will there be a firmware update to the M2T to allow primary and redundant Dante connections? Uh, that's a Dante issue on the Ultimo card set, which does not allow for that. Okay. So in the future, and we may move. We may move to the. I believe it's called the uh, Broadway, which is sort of a in between. You know, there's Ultimo. Chip. Yeah, it's yeah. a different chipset. We yeah. may move to that chipset, but. At the moment, Ultimo is what's in there. It's a four channel. It's it works very nicely for the equipment, right. but it doesn't right. offer the redundant. Yeah. And what's why is the minimum TX power 25 mill, milliwatt and not lower? Well, as I mentioned, the digital stuff is starting to go lower, uh, down to 10. So that's where we're headed. Uh, do, do any electro bag receivers have network connectivity to connect to wireless designer? 
or this Dante. Time, no, unless you and some people are considering the D squared or the DSQD to be a bag receiver, and it does offer that. Uh, but none of the uh, the small compact ones have that. No. Do the M2T transmitters only work with electrosonic combiners, or are there any issues using any other combiner? Uh, RF is RF for the most part. The key there that you want to look for is that they really need to have a lot of headroom because that digital signal is a square wave. And so I would say that you want to use combiners that are capable of 250 milliwatts per channel. And there's only a handful of those and they're generally right. fairly highly priced. Right. We've tested our system with the Shure 841 uh, and uh, it works well, and as well as the radioactive designs and uh, the, the professional wireless systems. You know, those high-end combiners generally do work. Uh, it's the reason we have one is we design it from scratch to work with the M2T, so it's a good match. Uh, but no, I mean RF's RF as long as you got enough headroom to handle those. Uh, the, the the key there with digital is the peak to average ratio is much higher than it is with analog. And and if we could, Mark. Mark would like to see the walk test back on wireless design. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Let me get back over there and show that very quickly. That is kind of a cool feature, walk test, yes. So uh, it's a, a frame specific uh, tool. So like if, I, if I've got a stack of receivers here and I click on my stack on the left, uh, walk test recorder does not show. So I've got to click on a specific frame and do this channel by channel and walk test recorder. So I'm gonna pick channel one since I have a transmitter already tuned there. Uh, you've got some parameters that you can adjust uh, what, what it's gonna show. Uh, I could even look at my battery voltage and my link status. So we'll go ahead and I, I, I'm curious myself on and we show those. You can record the audio, but to do that, you need to get the audio into the PC. It's not gonna come over the network connection or the USB. So what what some people do is they take the headphone output from their receiver, get it into a uh, you know an audio interface into their computer, and then it'll record. So to do this, we create a new file, and uh, let's just say walk test practical show tech, and now we've created a file. So that's where this information is going to reside, and then we can start recording. And this is looking at what the receiver sees on that channel. And as I said, you see your diversity status, your squelch status, link status, and so on. And nothing's really happening on that channel because my transmitter is off, but I'm gonna turn it on. And you'll see now suddenly much stronger RF level, link status good. Within a few seconds, you should see battery status. Okay, there we go. And um, now, Imagine I'm to simulate this. I'm just going to kind of curl over, fold over my antenna, and try to get uh, some signal loss here, and maybe get diversity to switch as an example. Okay, so there we go. Now we see some variation in the signal. Uh, you would also see your audio level if I had a mic connected to this thing. And as you, you walk around, screw the antenna. Just take the antenna off. Uh, this one doesn't come off. Oh, it's fixed. Okay. Yeah, but like, you could do yeah, that. Some... Yeah wire cutters with you or something like that <laughs> yeah you could take it into our repair shop and say hey can you fix this what happened to this thing We've... well Pete told me demo. Come... so if you were recording your audio you could also basically uh, describe where you are on the stage and so on so then you come back to your unit stop now we can we can play this and and rewind it and and look at it um which is which is handy, and um, this That's this really gives you powerful. a way. Yeah, it's it's a, an amazing way to test your system before you have to go live and look at the potential places where dropouts might be occurring that you were unaware. Maybe there's shadow. Yeah, other, or... other a workbench has a walk test and, and stuff, mm -hmm. but not with audio. Okay, right, right. So yeah, like I say, very very good tool. Uh, let's get we can now, now that I'm playing it, I can rewind it uh, and look at these spots. So it's uh, quite nice. And I can open up ones from uh, that I did, you know, a couple of weeks ago as an example. And same thing. So you can just store these and look at them. 
And that's one that where you do see some audio level. I must add a mic on that day. And it also shows to your diversity state. So it's one of those things where look for trouble areas where all of a sudden diversity starts going crazy and maybe you see a couple dropouts. You got to wonder why that place on the stage. Maybe there's uh, an issue. Maybe there's shadowing, whatever. Is that diversity line just telling you that the up a graph above it is one antenna or the other? Uh, it depends or is on that the, system? the other antenna. Right. Yeah, it, it depends on the receiver. Uh, a lot of our receivers have uh, phase switching diversity, and uh, some of them also offer ratio where it's you know one antenna or the other or one system or a blend of the two. So it really depends on what the hardware is right. offering as to what this is going to show. Okay. Cool. Any Thank other you questions? Much. Yeah, yeah, that's before it. Before we get back. Okay. Good stuff. All right. So there's a link. By the way, YouTube, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of resources there, not just the ones I mentioned, but uh, several years of, of videos on different topics, including products and whatnot. So I want to cover a few real-world systems to see how people might put, put you know, a package together for a particular type of use. So Cal Moots is a freelancer that does work for NBC and was out at the Olympics in Korea during a very cold winter. And he said it was sub-freezing temperature for weeks. Uh, you can see how, how heavily dressed he is. And uh, he used a portable bag type system with a couple of the dual channel receivers and the LTs for talent and a couple SMQVs for uh, camera hop and using a sound devices recorder. So that's a very, very portable four channel system plus. On an episodic uh, scripted television, you might see a much larger uh, kind of cart system. This is Joe Foglia has worked on a number of really big TV shows like Scrubs. And uh, this one is called Chambers. It's got Uma Thurman in it. It's on Netflix. And he's using the duet system for IFB. So his uh, boom op can hear the fold back. And when he started using it, he told me, you wouldn't believe it, the boom op went crazy. Because now all of a sudden, he's hearing the refrigerator running in the, in the room next door and things like that. And he's just going a little bit nuts until they got used to how quiet it was. So you can see here, he's got a variety of uh, transmitters, some SSM or NSSM for picky talent mostly SM widebands and SMQVs, plus the HMA for uh, the, the boom mic. Chris Monroe in the UK uses uh, uh, the SM type transmitters for the boom mic, which I find interesting. And he also used our PDR miniature recorders, uh, which were discontinued at the end of last year. And there's uh, the replacement products called the MTCR. Uh, but that's for the stunts. You know, Tom Cruise likes to jump out of planes and hang off of helicopters and and they captured him that way since wireless wasn't practical because of the distances. But uh, there you see the SMB transmitter and a little phantom power box on the uh, the boom mic. The the uh, show Frozen has 52 channels of SSMs and Venue 2s, and it's been running just over two years now on Broadway. It's one of the big hit shows for sure. And uh, not as many people know about this, but our stuff's out there on rock touring. Uh, the guitar players really love the sound of the wireless. Uh, another one is Eva Gardner, the bass player for Pink, uh, switched a couple years ago to our wireless. And uh, again, that digital hybrid, no companioning, it just sounds really, really good. And uh, the latency is low enough, nobody nobody minds. And so this is uh, the Dead Daisies uses our stuff as well. And then uh, this is a large scale TV production from a few years ago, uh, Martin Kelly, RIP. Uh, and a huge amount of wireless on this, as well as our Aspen systems and our Dante units, is how they routed all this wireless around. And th those shows are almost incomprehensible to me. But uh, Pete, have you ever worked on a show like this? Uh, not really, no. But you're you're using this many wireless, and things are routed all over the place for the type all of the stuff time. That you do. All the time. Yeah. 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 But most reality shows, you see this giant racks of gear. If they're a studio show, like the cooking shows. Uh, Master Chef Canada, uh, Brent Marchensky took me around to show me their studio, and I was flabbergasted by how much wireless was was happening on set in these things. And it's a real challenge. At least on the set, you have some control over it, versus you know the festivals where things get really crazy. It gives you some idea of the scale of uh, systems that are used for these larger uh, types of productions. All right, to to wrap things up here. You know, now we see both digital and analog systems on on just about every show uh, with in-ears, comms, talent mics, ENG systems, 
And we've got uh, systems that cover many of those functions. Uh, latency is a really important thing to consider, uh, not only in the wireless, but factoring in if you're going into Dante systems and what that might uh, incur latency-wise. Any, any uh, sample rate converted uh, signal chains are going to also be a factor there. And, you know, we always say this, and uh, fortunately, a lot of people do take us up on it, but we're here to help you. You know, as uh, Kelly mentioned at the beginning, you know, we've been around a long time, since 1971. Uh, we've serviced the uh, entertainment industry, uh, the news industry, television production, movie production. And our goal is always to help you get your system up and running to the best as possible. And sometimes that means eliminating stuff. I, I really challenge everybody, if you've got an equipment list that you're about to put in a show, run it by us. And uh, if you haven't bought all the stuff yet and you're thinking about which systems to put in, we'll help you get the right antennas, we'll help you save money, we'll eliminate things that you don't need, and we'll always lean on passive systems are better and not to over amplify your RF as we explained in, in that section. So um, a lot of stuff to think about. Uh, we're a resource for you. I think people do know that Due to COVID-19, you know, our factory is is on a very reduced schedule, uh, but we are there. Our service team is there. We will take your emails and your calls. You can reach us via various means. I think most people know they, they can uh, get us on our Facebook group. We'll definitely reply. Uh, company Facebook, uh, we're on Instagram. There are a lot of places to reach us. So please reach out and we will respond very quickly and we're happy to help. So let's open up the floor to uh, questions. If there's anything that we didn't cover or Anything that you'd like to uh, talk about briefly, we'll we'll talk about it now. There were just a couple of comments along the line. One probably came from a, an old man like me. He needs bigger numbers and letters on his R1A IFBs. Oh I yeah, he doesn't, probably... I guess he doesn't want to get glasses. You know, that anything. was really cool. The new one fixes all those problems, Carl. That's right, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. The, the, the yeah. IFB R1A is the last thing that we make that has the hex switches, and that's what he's talking about, there's two little tiny yeah, 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 yeah. on the side. And it's funny because when I started Electrosonics more than 15 years ago, uh, I remember someone making a comment about that, like, oh, I have to use glasses to see these things. And I was like, huh, well, I can see them. Well, I'll tell you, I cannot see them anymore. Yeah, and so yeah. it's good for all of us to have displays that are backlit and you know, we, we wanna make it easier. Particularly if it's an older unit where the switch is kind of mangled a little bit, you're yeah. not quite sure where you're connected, you know. And even exactly. I have a I have an eye loop that I carry to look at it just to see if I'm actually where the arrow is on the switch, you know. So, but yeah. often the only way to do it is to listen to the receiver until you get the right channel. Yeah, exactly. Is you you hope the the 1.6 meg switch is in the right place, <laughs> and then and then you can do the 100 kilohertz switch, and then fish around until you find it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, there was one other little question, which I don't know if we can get to. Um, Henry would like you to uh, itemize the transmitters with and without internal isolators. Which ones have built-in isolators, and which don't? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. So for a long time, when, when we moved to frequency agile systems, okay, we wanted, we were very concerned that, you know, with our relatively high power, that intermods would be an issue. So we designed into those systems a circulator isolator. This is a one-way RF valve, and these are custom made for us that cover that 25 meg band. If you want to cover a wider frequency band with something like an isolator, there's only two ways to do that. And one is to make a very large isolator and the other one is to bank switch between them. But both of those things are not practical in a tiny belt pack transmitter. So when we, uh, all of our units up to, uh, that have a single block range. Okay, so that's like your um, SMV, SMQV, any of the SM series before that, uh, the UM400 series, uh, you know, and, and the, the T4 transmitters, the uh, IFB T4. Those all have the circulator isolator, and it's a wonderful thing. It keeps intermods at bay even when running fairly high powers. Uh, so when we went wideband, so when you're talking about the um, the LT, LMB, SSM, uh, SM wideband family and so on, these do not have the isolator because they have a three block or more tuning range, and any of the new digital transmitters also do not. So instead of that, they have a highly linear, fairly high current output stage. 
And the way you'll notice that is they, the battery consumption is a little bit higher on those units than of the older SMQV family and things like that. So anything wideband is not, uh, does not have an isolator. And instead of that, we have a linear output stage. Got a note from Marco wanted me to elaborate a little bit more on testing uh, your antenna cables without having a spectrum analyzer or or a uh, 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 any way to feed a RF. And it occurred to me that I didn't say you have to use exactly the same antenna when you're testing right next to the receiver right. Right. and then plug in your 250 foot cable and use that same antenna and put your transmitter the same exact distance from the antenna on both ends the other thing is yeah. you won't have you won't be able to tell db per se but you can look at the change on your meter of the receiver compared to what you have as a known good cable so you take a known cable yeah. you see how much rf comes through and you might have to pad that actually pad down the cable to get an on-screen indication of what the rf is if you're you may know, or maybe just move the transmitter, make it 50 feet from the antenna, anything, but you need an on screen. And also, if you're looking at a spectrum analyzer, all you can reference is the peak level. You won't be able to see dB per se. So the right. trick is to measure a good table and then you know how, what the other cable should be. Yeah, that's great. And, and you know, that's one place where the walk test recorder might help you. It's got a pretty yeah. detailed scale of RF level. So you could look at it before and then after, you know, pause it and then record again with the cable in place and then switch that out and so on. So there's particularly yeah. if you can uh, shield the transmitter. So you basically your RF is on screen, not full, full level, because when right. it's full level, it's full level. You can't tell anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, good point. Uh, and. Do you have a preferred antenna combiner? For the SRC receivers? Oh, an antenna distro, uh, that's what they're asking, um, multi-coupler uh, for the SRC. Right. Um, right. I don't have, you know, have a one in personally in mind, but, you know, the, the PSC makes some portable units, and when I looked at those recently, it seemed like they had a decent amount of RF headroom, uh, so those would be one choice. That's probably not the only one. Uh, so right. I would just look around and I would look at the, that factor of, of the IP3 if it's listed. If it's not listed, get a hold of the manufacturer and ask them that question. You want something with enough headroom to work. And, uh, you know, again, just be careful with, with that because if you overload that stage, then it's already overloaded for all your receivers. And how, how, would, how do they, I often wonder this, I sometimes walk up to uh, ENG guys and they have a bag hanging around the neck and they have six receivers and two transmitters all like this. Yeah. Yep. How do they do that and keep them working well together? Well, you know, first off, it doesn't always work well together and we get a lot of calls <laughs> about that. And so we we suggest that they outboard their camera hops or their IFB transmitters that, that just move it a few inches away. Uh, yeah. Move it onto the strap or the outside of the bag, you know, make it six inches instead of two. That'll make a difference. Again, inverse or maybe, square line. You know. Or maybe just a three foot antenna cable and put the transmit antennas on your back or something like that. Yes, they exactly. In the and bag. Yeah, yeah. We make antennas specifically for that. Uh, there's one called the ACO AXTX, and it's an SMA connector cable antenna. It's four feet long. And uh, you can make it yourself on our YouTube channel. There's there's instructions how to do that. In fact, I think we just issued a, or we will shortly a wire list about that subject, making a cable coax antenna. You just take a, a coax cable like the RG174 that you mentioned, and if it's got a BNC on it, then you cut it off and you strip back uh, the the center conductor to the length of the antenna that you want, and then you shrink tube over it. It's pretty simple. Uh, but then you could have those antennas like your IFB coming and your camera hop on your strap, you know, on your straps and ideal would be pointing above your, um, your shoulders to give it as much range as possible. But yeah, getting those transmit antennas out of the bag. And then the other answer is frankly, that's what Electrosonics is famous for. I mean, our, our UCR 411A is an extremely robust receiver that people love because it's just bulletproof. You stick a bunch of them in a bag and they work. You know, they have very good filtering, uh, very and high IP3. 
And usually an audio person with a bag on an ENG crew is within a few feet of the camera people. But if they're far away, you want those receive antennas to be line of sight, line yeah. of sight over the audience uh, yeah. to, to where, they're, where, they, where the transmitters are actually being used. And I've seen people even take their fish poles and put an antenna on top of the fish poles to fish pole into the top of an audience with the yeah, antenna. That- we see some interesting contraptions with people yeah. mounting up antennas on their on their bags and they're on masts and things like that. But hey, you know, whatever works. See some clever stuff. Kevin Parrish plugged the Audio Limited A10 mm-hmm. as, as a terrific digital device. Yeah, and they're making some interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Any other questions? No, I think that's it for now. They, it, just a bunch of thank yous coming through. Yeah, Excellent. I threw well, a picture of the IFB receiver in the handouts because as a guy wearing glasses now, um, I appreciate this update. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a new you know, world. your wireless, um, while you were talking, I was over at the website scrolling through the wireless at electrosonics.com. Man, are there some great articles in there, folks, to go, you know, and... And it's pretty interesting because um, you know it's a lot of lot of different uh, perspectives on on different um, aspects you normally don't think of when you just think of a wireless microphone, right, or, a, right. or an IFB right. receiver. So that yeah. is a great tool. Uh, we'll make sure we add that to our links page because uh, just a lot of little uh, golden nuggets of knowledge in there. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much, Carl. It's been great. Thank, All thank right, guys. You. Thanks go. so much for having me. And, uh, you Thanks, know, Carl. It's a great and, uh, opportunity. Hey, you, Thanks, you Carl. Bet. Um, I will take this moment while we have this audience. Um, a lot of our Electrosonics users are TV and film folks. Um, Monday is all sports TV production. A1 panel at lunch with uh, Fred Aldis, Scott Prey. Um, you'll probably know Fred and Scott from... Uh, the uh, Super Bowl and from uh, mixing uh, Monday Night Football. Uh, Dave Grumvig will also be joining us, does the Masters, does TNT and Turner Sports, uh, NBA. Um, all these folks are very big about the the sonic, the, the soundscape that the listener experiences. And obviously, Parabs play a big role in um, what goes on on the field. So um, I would suggest everybody run over to practicalshowtech.com right now, sign up for that. In the afternoon, we're going to do a sports A2. Uh, that's uh, a lot of the same folks that that um, are doing those events, but from the perspective of um, on the field and behind the truck bay and what what are what are those jobs? Um, so I think Monday's going to be a pretty interesting thing, and there's so many things you can take away from how the broadcast world has to deal with things that are both there. It's all about fast, but reliability is always number one, right? So I think everybody who works in the live events from concerts to corporate AV and uh, to broadcast will really benefit from both those discussions. So um, please uh, be sure to sign up for that. Join us. Carl, thanks again, man, for, for oh, you're welcome. Uh, some brilliant information. <laughs> And the building such great products. Uh, give those uh, engineers big kudos for uh, what they pull off uh, on a uh, on a week to week yearly basis. Um, I will. Yeah, I always enjoy working with those guys. There's a lot of uh, ingenuity there, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of folks have been around for many many years with us, and and they've just done some brilliant work. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, to everybody else, go get some lunch. Go grab some breakfast. Oh, wait, wait, it's got something. Wait, wait. I didn't want to promote a show this afternoon at four o'clock, which is uh, programming IAS. And more importantly, we have Jason Eskew joining us. He is the software author of IAS, and he has present put together a really fascinating, totally above my head math discussion about exactly how he did it all. And he'd be a great person to have on. And he wanted everybody to know there is a version six coming and it will not work on a Mac. We're just going to get that question out of the way right now. (laughs) We'll be recording 
And no, there will not be a Mac version. If you ever wondered what the, the checkbox with second and third does, this his videos are really great. Pete and I were reviewing them this morning and you'll see right on that analyzer what happens and why the software chooses and does what it does. So um, that is a really good point, Pete. That's at 4 p.m. this afternoon. And he explains why the spacing is 0.299 and not 0.3. It's mm -hmm. very important and very yeah. distinct reason. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that would be the one you should go sign up for now as well. Um, you guys there don't have anywhere to go. Sign up. Sign up you now. Hurry, please, because there's only 400 spots left in the show. So. <laughs> right. It's almost now, sold out. Actually, we're um we are we are that one's growing pretty good. Um, uh, it's pretty amazing the attendance and uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting this afternoon. We already have 143 people signed up for uh for the IAS. Uh, so this is good news. And now uh, we had I should say we had 143 for you, Carl. So awesome. it was 100 uh something coming up this evening so that's it there's all the metrics everybody ever cared about so thanks exactly. for coming back mac um have a good day everybody and we'll see you back here in a couple hours by the way i just should mention oh. that the whole time i've been talking with uh with our 172 earphone and an old im transmitter so that's been my uh, my audio for the thing so there you go you've been soaking in it yep Who, who's your frequency coordinator well, thankfully, I only have to find one frequency. It's not too. There we go. Difficult. There we go. Sounds one good. frequency in mind. There we oh. go. Talk to you later. Bye bye. All right. Okay. Thanks, so everybody. Long. See ya. Have a good